everyone, I'm Karen Fenter, your host on the Remarkable Journey, No Passport Required, where we bring you the most innovative business solutions from resilient and persistent entrepreneurs who built a bridge into the new era when faced with unprecedented and sudden lockdown challenges. Every episode is an interview with a new business owner who will be sharing what they did to successfully navigate their journey through this time and how they managed to overcome the enormous hurdles they faced. This series is dedicated to you, the determined entrepreneur. But first, a very quick message from our sponsor. This episode of The Remarkable Journey, No Passport Required, is brought to you by the Revenue Breakthrough Shift. Do you feel that you have an amazing business that you believe in with everything inside you, but it's just not bringing in the kind of money you know it has potential to make? And you're not sure how to make the switch from barely surviving or just surviving on the hamster's wheel to really thriving financially with a business that enables you to build the life you love. So I'd like you to imagine the relief of not having to figure it out on your own, not wasting time and money trying things that aren't effective, but instead having the steps you need to achieve that already mapped out for you. The revenue breakthrough shift is designed to accelerate revenue growth in your business and to help you explore new ideas and new ways of doing things, which will enable your business to remain relevant and thriving. Our 14 week online program provides you with the roadmap and personal support on the journey to strengthening your financial position and creating financial security in your business so that you can have the life you love and the life that your business was meant to provide for you and your family. And now to introduce our very special guest, Mike Abel is the founding partner and chief executive officer of m and c Saatchi Abel and m and c Saatchi Group South Africa. With a career spanning three decades, he has headed heavyweight agencies in both South Africa and Australia before launching the multiple award-winning m and c Saatchi Abel in South Africa in 2010. One of the preeminent minds and leaders in advertising and communication on the continent, Mike has steered phenomenal growth for the agency, which today works with an impressive list of blue chip clients. In less than a decade, he and his partners built a top five communications company that has become an important part of the global network. The agency has also been credited as the fastest growing advertising agency in the history of South Africa. Mike is an advocate of removing clutter, chasing excellence and championing diversity of thought. His philosophy is the people with the best people win. Proudly South African, Mike uses the platform that his incredible entrepreneurship and leadership provides to contribute positively and strongly to the national discourse. In Mike's words, we all have a duty to be part of a positive, self-fulfilling prophecy. Mike, thank you so much for being with us. Welcome to the show. Um, for our viewers, just to let them know that they're in for a real treat. Lots and lots of wisdom. I know that Mike has to share with you. So I'm going to jump right in. Thanks so much, Mike. Hi, Karen. Oh, great to be on the show with you and look forward to uh, sharing whatever thoughts, ideas, and hopefully inspiration I can. I have no doubt about the inspiration. Thanks, Mike. So just to jump in, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. One of your favorite quotes by Hunter S. Thompson. 
Normally, Mike, when we have a favorite quote, uh, it becomes a favorite because it has personal meaning to us. It aligns with who we are and how we show up in the world. Can you speak more to that quote? I really love that quote, by the way. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great quote. I'm being attacked by a fruit fly on this side, despite there being no fruit in sight. Um, so um, I guess for me, what is uh, powerful about that quote is, the, I, I, I like another quote, which is, um, the only true happiness is to live your own life in your own way. And I think that that plays directly into that Hunter S. Thompson quote, um, which I live by. And that is, so many people seek a life, Corin, of predictability and safety. Those are the things that they enshrine. And when I'm talking about safety, I'm not talking about personal safety. Obviously, everybody wants personal safety. But, you know, so I think we're going to be throwing lots of quotes around in this interview. But, you know, there is that great saying of you never discover new lands without losing the sight of the shore. And far too many people are terrified to lose sight of the shore, to explore, to go beyond. You know, there's another great quote, which is, you know, sometimes in your darkest place lies your greatest reward. So people are often scared to put themselves out there, to experiment, to trial, to feed their soul. And so what they do is they cauterize their hopes, their ambitions, um, their um, aspirations, their dreams for their own lives, uh, and then try to lead this safe, predictable life. Um, but that's not living, that's existing. You know. And so um, what I love about the Hunter S. Thompson quote is, you know, I want to lead a high impact, meaningful life where I can contribute as much as possible to um, my children's life, my wife's life, my colleagues and friends' life, and of course, my own life. And, you know, there's a great saying, another one, which is in life you get because of what you give, not because of what you take. But the truth of it, sometimes in life you need to take in order to give. So you need to be able to absorb the beauty and the joy of life, the adventure, the mystery. Um, you know, you learn a lot uh, from positive stuff happening in your life, but you learn far more by negative stuff happening in your life. And so I guess it's really about how do I maximize my time here to lead a purposeful life, to make a difference and to have fun along the way. What a beautiful way of looking at life and um, how you show up in life. That's really beautiful, Mike. Thanks for Thank sharing you. that. Um, I know that you launched the company in 2010. It was during a recession um, in an overtraded industry. And this is something very interesting. Normally when people are starting out on a new venture, they would shy away from that set of circumstances unless um, they were forced into that set of circumstances and they had no option. But usually they would wait or hang back and wait for things to get better. And I would love to know from you, what made you decide to go ahead anyway? So um, a bit of history, I guess, which is important. We had emigrated to Australia um, following an armed robbery and I think context and truth is always important in all storytelling. And uh, you know, Nelson Mandela said, may your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. And our decision to go to Australia, although I was going to run the best and biggest ad agency in Australia, in an incredibly beautiful and sophisticated city like Sydney, was still a fear-based decision. It was still, you know, we have young children, we want a predictable future, uh, in contravention to the quote that we looked at a moment ago. And uh, this is what we need to do. You know, and no sooner than we got there, then Sarah basically, my wife, um, realized that in the move, she had left behind everything she loved. The people that she loved and, you know, um, the um, city that she knew well and her family and whatever. Anyway, um, being in Australia, uh, as we got there, the global financial crisis hit. So it was very interesting because it was new country, new company, global financial crisis, quite a tricky situation to navigate. But what you realize in business, and particularly if you know your industry very well, 
is the body is the same. Whether you're running a, a company in New York or in London, and I have worked extensively internationally or throughout my career, or South Africa, the liver's in the same place, the heart's in the same place, the lungs, the kidneys, and it's very quick to spot clogs in the arteries or what you need to fix to, to improve and strengthen the company. Anyway, so um, I made those changes when I got to Australia. And soon after that, the PLC in London, MNC Saatchi, the listed company, said to me, would I consider opening South Africa as part of my region? So in addition to having um, Australia and the surrounding area, um, I would look at having South Africa because obviously I had a very strong network of potential clients and potential employees um, in South Africa. Anyway, um, Sara then said to me, let's go back and do this ourselves. You know, and I didn't feel that I could set up South Africa remotely from Australia. And it excited me, you know, the World Cup was happening in 2010. And I thought, you know, it's a great opportunity for, uh, for a new opportunity and to see actually, although it's one thing running big corporates, but can you actually start something from scratch? Um, and so basically, headed back to South Africa at the end of 2009, and six weeks later, opened the company um, with no clients, no revenue, no furniture even on the 1st of February, 2010. But what I did have was a very clear plan. And I had a very clear ambition. And um, I identified that there was a significant gap in the marketplace, and that there was a market in that gap as well. So I often say you need to look at both because sometimes people see a gap in the market, but it's not commercially viable. It might be a gap, but there isn't any money within that gap. So um, that's something for people to consider. And so I guess it was a very clear plan. And don't forget, I mean, you touched on the fact earlier that I've been in this industry for over 30 years. And so I knew how to go about starting something of meaning during a downturned economy. And my late mom um, was a real estate agent and she started, well, she was an academic actually, but she knew that academia, academia would never be able to, uh, you know, uh, allow her to live in the way she wanted to and travel the world and whatever. So she chose uh, to go into real estate. And she always used to say to me, Mikey, the best time to start a business is during a downturned economy, because when it turns, great success will follow. Unfortunately, we haven't had the benefit of that. 11 years later, we're still in a downturned economy, and yet we have managed to build something remarkable. So that's a wonderful um, lesson to the viewers, to everybody who's watching, is that start with a plan and have a vision. Don't um, kind of go into things and hope that they'll just unfold organically. Make things happen. Uh, That's right. And yeah, also, yeah. critically to that point, Corin, sorry to interrupt you, but critical to that, have the cash flow. Because if you cash flow is blood flow, and we'll use the plain analogy, I'm sure, in this conversation, but you know, I always say that sometimes our timelines and our cash horizons are not what our what the market has in mind. Sometimes liftoff takes longer than you expect. And a lot of brilliant businesses never reach liftoff because they run out of cash. And so it's really important to have sufficient backing uh, and to have sufficient line of access to funds to ensure that you have the timeline to see your business take off. That is so important. And thank you for bringing that up because I think people often forget that. People get passionate. They get carried away. I know this is something that can work. I can do it. I have the passion. And you know, when we're passionate, sometimes we're not thinking clearly. So I think that that is a really important piece of wisdom to have shared. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Mike, and that's quite a good segue actually talking about downturns in economy and challenges, etc. It's quite a good segue into my next question which is a passage from your book, Willing and Able. We are gonna discuss the book later on, but I'd like to just read this passage um, and it speaks quite a bit to what you've just mentioned. Every time there's been a problem, we've oriented ourselves towards it 
because we've learned that if you lean into a problem, you will find the solution. That moving into a headwind generates lift. And you kind of mentioned this a moment ago. So you've acknowledged that when things are challenging, which they are at the moment, and they have been for the last year, if not the last decade, but particularly through the last year, in many respects, there's never been a better time. Um, I'd love you to just build on that for the audience, if you can, please. Well, I'm not a fan of Henry Ford. Um, he wasn't a very nice man, <laughs> but he did say something. And that he said is that planes um, take off in headwinds, not with tailwinds. And um, that headwinds do actually precipitate opportunity. And I think that a lot of people live their lives concentrating on what they can't do rather than what, on that, what they can do. And so I think that difficult times certainly um, present opportunities. And you will always see companies grow. I mean, if you have a look right now, um, we are seeing logistics companies, e-commerce companies, online payment platforms, uh, digital companies, FinTech are all thriving. Those new generation companies, you look at their share price, you look at where they're going. And um, I think what hard times do or difficult times do is they often widen cracks in companies that were able to hide those cracks for many years. Um, and so I think that although these moments right now are impossibly difficult, and what I do want to say is, I mean, I have huge empathy and sympathy for the hospitality industry, for the tourism industry, because those industries, no matter how brilliant you are, it is very difficult to pivot. It's really about surviving. Um, and as I wrote in an article recently, which was on the Daily Maverick, about one can't wait for the phone to ring anymore. Today, you actually have to look at all of your skills, stuff that you might not currently be practicing, you know, um, but that you have the skill or you have the experience. And where else can you use those skills? Where else can they be? Uh, uh, useful and where else can they manifest in terms of being commercially viable to keep the wolf from the door. So I think that if we do lean into the problem, if we don't hide away from the fact that our businesses aren't performing or whatever it might be, and you say, actually, what can I do? Forget what I can't do. What can I do? It's a very useful orientation to problem solving and spotting opportunities. Incredible, yes. Um, rather than sitting in the problem, as you say, we can either yeah. sit in the problem and look at the problem and keep looking at the problem, or we can shift perspective and look for the solution. And as you say, many times the solution lies in what you can do and leveraging off that. That's something to really bear in mind, particularly right now at the moment. Yeah. Mike, um, just to kind of change from that a little bit, mm. the story of naming the company, which you launched mm. in South Africa, MNC Saatchi, with the ABLE as an addition. There, I know that there's quite a story to that. And there was a reason, other than just kind of having your name up in lights, which I know is not you, that you did that. Can you please share that with the audience? What was the, what was the reason? What motivated you to name the company in such a way? Sure. So, um, you know, I'd spent many years before I left South Africa, within the Ogilvy Group from age 25 to 41, um, ending up uh, running the Cape Group of Companies and then um, being uh, co-leading the National Group of Companies. And, uh, and then I went to join uh, MNC Saatchi in Australia. But MNC Saatchi had been in South Africa before. And um, uh, around about the time of the dot bomb, they disinvested from South Africa. Um, and so the brand had been here before. And then the Saatchi brothers, before they started MNC Saatchi, for the first 25 years of their career, they had a company called Saatchi and Saatchi, Morris and Charles Saatchi, which is a very I famous remember, brand. I actually remember it as Saatchi and Saatchi. It's always kind of there in my mind. Yeah. Correct. Correct. 
and uh, and so Saatchi and Saatchi does also operate in South Africa. It's a big global company owned by the Publicis Group. And so coming back to South Africa and having, I guess, um, an established and trusted reputation in this marketplace, I needed to tell people where to find Mark Abel. Um, and if I didn't tell them where to find me, they might phone Saatchi and Saatchi, which I'm sure they still do, actually. <laughs> I think they've benefited enormously from my return um, because I've even had clients phoning to say to me, we're in your reception. And I say to them, uh, no, you're not because I'm here waiting for you. <laughs> and actually it's the wrong agency. So I guess really, I didn't want people to go to um, Saatchi and Saatchi or to go to Ogilvy when wanting to work with me and my team. So I needed to give them a clear idea as to where I was. And as you say, it's not vanity, it's a signpost. Uh, and it doesn't represent me as Mike Abel, it represents the South African partnership um, because this company is very much a partner model. It's a collaboration of friends, it's a federation of entrepreneurs. And um, there are a number of us that have collaborated to do something and start our own company in our own way. So it's just the local flavor to an international company. I think that it's interesting and it's something interesting for the viewers to take note of, of leverage off those kinds of things. For example, you've said that people know your name in the industry. So you leveraged off that by adding your name, um, MNC Saatchi Abel, as you say, so that people could find you leverage off all of those opportunities um, look very carefully at what you're doing see where the opportunities are and leverage off those I mean you may have not had some of the clients particularly in the beginning look today you're very well known in South Africa this I know but particularly in the beginning you may not have managed to secure some of the clients who you did um, if you'd not had the able on the end Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, the, the interesting thing, Corin, is that there are a lot of people who wanted to work with me historically, but when I was running a very big company, they didn't feel they had the budgets to work with a company of that size. And they knew that when I started the company from scratch, there was an opportunity to work with me and, uh, and with a smaller company and a more intimate relationship at the time. And so you actually never know uh, who knows you or who may want to work with you. Um, and again, you know, I'm quoting my, my rather brilliant late mom Hermian here, but she always used to say, contacts are contracts. And that is true. You know, your network is one of the most powerful things that you have. Uh, and sometimes you're not even aware of what that network is. But, you know, we had very small companies that joined us right in the beginning. We had a startup. Um, called Take Two, who joined us in the very, very early days. You would have read about it in the book. But today that's takealot.com, you know. And so we've gone on a wonderful growth journey with a lot of businesses that were very small or starting off in those days that have grown to being, you know, wonderful, big, successful companies today. Fantastic. You all grew up together. <laughs> yes. You're all kind of born together and grew up together and, and you've taken a journey together and they're still with you today. And I love that, you know, I love the loyalty and, and obviously they're immensely happy. So that's a lovely story to share. Um, yes, Mike, we're going to talk about the plane analogy now. <laughs> you mentioned it a minute ago. When you started the company in South Africa, what is your long-term goal? And this is where the plane analogy comes in. Can you share what that analogy means to you, please? Sure. So when um, the PLC asked me to start the South African group, I said to them, uh, they would need to invest significantly into South Africa. I said, you know, I have the means to start an agency, if you like, called Mike Abel and Friends, whatever we would have called it. Um, but that would have been um, a gravel landing strip, and I would have landed Papa Cubs. I said, but if you want me to open the company for you in South Africa, you need to allow me to build an international airport, and then I will land Dreamliners for you. So it will require meaningful investment. Uh, it will take a longer timeline. 
But once I've bought that airport, we'll be able to land those planes. And you know, um, in the movie, The Field of Dreams of Kevin Costner, there's a great saying of build it and they will come. But that doesn't happen, Corin. You have to build it and then go fetch them. That's the difference. Um, and so I knew that if I built that airport, then I would be able to go out and attract A380s and, and Dreamliners to land at our airport. And it took us 18 months from inception to land our first big account, which was uh, Heineken South Africa, or, or Heineken, the global brand, but, uh, but uh, you know, operating here. And, um, and so uh, we wouldn't have won that account had we not built that international airport, had they not seen the infrastructure, they would have never given a brand of that scale and value to a little startup. We needed to have that scale, uh, which we understood well, and that internationalism. And which brings me to another point around people wanting to start business or in business. I could have owned 100% of my company today. Um, I've always chosen to have a small part of something extraordinary than a large part of something ordinary. So even though I own a smaller part of this company today, I would wager it's worth exponentially more than if I'd owned 100% of a small advertising agency. So it's really about thinking long-term. It's about thinking strategically. It's about wanting to take other people on the journey with you. It's about uh, believing in an inclusive economy um, and having a sharing culture and ensuring that the people that you take along the journey with you also do very well on that journey. There's so much gold in there. And talking about people, the people with the best people win. Um, in my introduction, I had quoted you. We've done a lot of quotes here today, but they're all really meaningful and really relevant. Um, so I'd quoted that from you in the introduction today, the people with the best people win. And I really feel that's a heartfelt quote that comes from you. Why is that important in a business? Why are the people important? Why is it important to, although that seems to be obvious, why is it important to hire the best people and the right people? What difference does that make to a business? What is the impact? Well, I think it does cut to um, personal security. And I'm a very secure person. I'm not a, an insecure person in any way. I'm very comfortable not knowing something. I'm very comfortable keeping quiet and listening to what other people have to share and tell me because I already know what I know. I don't know what I don't know. And so when you surround yourself with brilliant people, to come at stuff with fresh ideas from diverse backgrounds, with different intentions, but aligned ambitions, um, you can create amazing things. So if I look at uh, MNC Saatchi Abel, we are um, structured, as I said earlier, much more like an accounting firm or an architectural practice or a law firm, where there are a lot of partners that participate in the company. And I learn enormously from them. And in our collaborative efforts, we come up with much better and much more robust solutions than I would come up with on my own. And so when you're coming up with better solutions, you're only coming up with better solutions because you're working with brilliant people. But coming up with better solutions means you will do better. Um, you will attract business. Your clients will grow. Um, you will look at their businesses on a multi-level and multi-layered way. So um, I think that um, there are very few um, careers where you won't benefit from many people. I mean, you know, even if you have a look at a surgeon, I guess, uh, who goes into, uh, into uh, theater every day on his own to do what he does, he's benefiting from all of that global research. Everything else that his colleagues around the world are learning, better procedures, better ways of doing it. If you open your mind to anything, there actually isn't any solo uh, success. Success ultimately is always one of teamwork, whether it's teamwork at home, whether it's collaboration with your partner, whether it's collaboration with your friends or people in work. We are all better if we open ourselves uh, to getting the best thoughts and ideas from other people 
and that we are secure enough to take those thoughts and ideas and not to feel like we need to know best. So I'm very comfortable to say, I don't know the answer. Come, let's work on that answer together because you'll get to a much better place than a half-baked answer because you are too afraid to say you can't crack it yourself. Absolutely. I think sometimes ego gets in the way for some people and um, they feel that they have to do it on their own. But in business, as you say, this is not always the best solution. The best solution is to have lots of ideas and see what works best. Be open, as you say. You don't need to be insecure because you're building a better business. And the best way to do that is from brilliant input and surround yourself with brilliant people. Um, sometimes they say we should have people who are even smarter than us in our businesses. So surround yourself with brilliant people if you want a brilliant outcome, basically. So thanks for that, Mike. Um, I know this is quite a, not a difficult, it's easy and difficult, the question I'm about to ask you, because how do you choose? I know that you're a multi-award winning company, so it's very difficult for me to say what's been your biggest success to date, because there are so many, and how do you choose one? I can answer that. Do, do, you, do you have a, a specific milestone that's been particularly meaningful to you? I know every award is meaningful, I, I have no doubt, but do you have a particular milestone that's really meaningful for you? Yes, I do. So when people ask me what is the most important or rewarding thing that, um, that I've done in my career, um, in 2014, we had a very young, guy in advertising starting off in his career, a man called Max Patsak. And Max was very concerned about homeless people. And uh, he noticed that the area in which we work, being Greenpoint, um, there are a lot of homeless people on the street because there's the Haven Night Shelter. And he was worried that it was, uh, I always feel like I'm quoting the Game of Thrones, that winter was coming. And, uh, and it was, and he was worried about how these people um, would be able to keep warm. And so um, he had a germ of an idea and he went to our credit director, Gordon Ray, and he shared this idea and Gordy phoned me and he said, Mike, you need to come down to my office. I wanna show you something very exciting. And so I went in there um, together with the managing director of the company, uh, Jason Harrison. And the idea was the world's first rent-free, premises-free, free pop-up clothing store for the homeless called the street store and i looked at this idea and i thought it was absolutely brilliant um, and his copywriter partner um, kaylee leverton also had a huge passion for this idea and so we designed it beautifully we added to the idea we took away from the idea and then the street store was born and we launched that um, on a corner outside the silesian institute in cape town in 2014 and we then decided to go open source, which meant that people could go on to the streetstore.org and download all of the material themselves to host the street store around the world. And it has become a global movement today, Corin, clothing homeless people everywhere. Uh, were it not for COVID, we'd be well over a thousand street stores. Before COVID hit, we were sitting on around about 976 street stores. Basically every three days, a street store is happening somewhere in the world. Um, so we've clothed, clothed well over half a million people around the world in as far-flung places as Calcutta, <laughs> if it's still called that, and uh, you know Bangladesh, Nepal. Um, when we get to see where these different street stores are happening, it's just completely insane. Um, and it's then you look at that and you say that's making an enormous difference to people's lives. And uh, and then the other thing that uh, that it did was it went on and won a gold award at Cannes. Um, which is, um, you know, kind of one, the most prestigious award show in the world. And then last year, it was it was a finalist for Fast Company Global in New York, best world changing ideas. So um, although it's received many accolades and won awards at every single advertising show around the world, pretty much, for me the real reward is knowing that we are clothing homeless people and we are bringing dignity to them. You know. Um, uh, one at the very first street store that I worked at, this guy arrived 
in the most tatty clothes with his toes sticking outside the front of his shoes. And he had hit hard, very hard times. So and he told us he was going for a job interview. And could we kit him out for it? And we dressed him up nicely in a suit and shoes. And he looked a million dollars and he went off. And then he came back at the end of the afternoon and he kind of looked two feet taller. And he said, I've got that job. Um, and maybe you wouldn't have without the street store. Oh, that's amazing. I've actually got goosebumps. That's a really beautiful story. And it's wonderful that you have taken your creativity and your openness for new ideas and the fact that you're open to other people's ideas as well, because as you said, this came, it was kind of a collaborative effort and um, that you've done something really meaningful that's touched a lot of lives. I mean, I didn't, I know about the street store, but I didn't realize that there were almost a thousand street stores globally. I mean, that's quite incredible. And that's within the space of six to seven years, you say 2014. Correct. And um, so that's quite incredible, Mike. So I can understand where that is really a heartfelt achievement for you. How can it not be? Really incredible, yeah. really well done on that. And now I'm going to take you to the completely opposite end of the spectrum. We've talked about something that's, that's been a meaningful achievement for you. Um, I'd like to ask you, is there any big kind of pitfall, anything that you've experienced that you've learned a lot from in business? Um, any difficulty or any challenge that you've faced, something that you might have done, not wrong, but that you could have done differently and learned a lot from that? Um, yes, I mean, I think that um, one of our partners in the company, co-founder of MNC Society Abel is Robert Grace, and he talks about reason, season, time of life. And uh, sometimes in life, you don't get something for a reason or a season. Um, sometimes you um, expect to win something because you've been really good at the way you've gone about approaching that problem or that pitch, and you don't get it. And I guess sometimes it's a reflection on the fact that maybe the people making that decision don't have the same view on what they need as you have. Uh, so maybe there isn't a land ambition. Um, you know, often it's a reflection often on them. You know, I mean, give you an example. You know, when I started my career, the first company I applied for was uh, to do the graduate trainee program at Ogilvy, South Africa. And they interviewed me for the job and they turned me down. Um, and they didn't feel that I was uh, of the right level uh, for that company. And then two years later, they headhunted me. Um, and within nine years of having been turned down to be a trainee uh, account executive, I was the managing director of that company. Wonderful. And so it's really about not owning, I guess, um, what other people or other companies put onto you, but learning from it. So don't see it as a barrier or as, as a hindrance, see it as a platform. What can I learn? What can I do better? How could I approach it differently next time, as opposed to thinking less of oneself and losing self-belief? And that's been a very, very important thing for me is to work through it, contextualize it, and then say, how can I meaningfully never bullshit yourself ever? If you need to own something, if you've done something wrong, own it and learn from it. And then say, how would I do it differently or better next time? That is absolute magic, Mike. That really is absolute magic. You know, we hear stories about, um, for example, Oprah, who was turned down from appearing on radio, I think it is, and, and look at the success she's made, and so many people. And A.K. Rowling and Harry Potter. Absolutely. In other words, if you believe in yourself, don't give up. It's there, just do things differently if you need to. It doesn't mean you don't need to be self-confident. It may just mean you need to tweak something you're doing, but don't give up when the passion is there and the commitment is there, keep going. That was real gold, real gold. 
um, talking about difficulties over the last year, let's call it a year, because I think it's almost a year now since we've been in this situation. Of course, we've had lockdown. You would have had to close the office because all businesses were closed at a point. Was there anything that you did differently or how did you, of course you had to do things differently. How did you do things differently to make sure that your business survived during that time? So I think um, it's always important to anticipate in business. And what we had done is we had considered what if something happened to our business where we couldn't operate from the agency. So for example, what if the building burnt down? Um, how do we back up our files? How could we operate away uh, or off campus if we needed to? So we had pondered those uh, realities or possibilities rather. And so when COVID hit, we had already set up uh, remote working, MS Teams, all of those things as, uh, as possibilities. But that's one thing in terms of having the tech. I think what's much more important is having the, uh, the insight, the intuition and the business smarts, I guess, to ride or navigate uh, the storm. So on the day that uh, we were closing the agency, I spoke to all staff and I said to them, what if we use this as an opportunity to do the best work we've ever done? Not to survive, but what actually if we meet the challenge head on and then we leapfrog and we say, we're actually going to use this time to do remarkable work, to have the time and to have the space to actually spend more time on solving problems, more time on crafting. Um, there was a poster that we had made for the door of the agencies in Cape Town and Johannesburg, which said, our doors may be closed, but our minds remain open. And, uh, and that was our orientation. And so what we did was we stepped up dramatically our, um, engagement with the people um, in terms of online um, culture building. So people would have virtual drinks parties and pajama parties and they would make TikToks and they would share a whole lot of amazing stuff about themselves and their lives and communicate. And we sent people hampers and packs to their home and we had virtual events. And so basically we didn't look at, as I said earlier, what we couldn't do, we said, all we're going to do is focus on what we can do. Um, and if you have a look at our company, we employ 350 people um, in South Africa. 95% of them are graduate, smart, ambitious, keen people. We've hired over 60 people during COVID that we've never met physically, never been into the agency, hired them online, and they've been working virtually. So even if we, while we talk today, Corin, I only have about 15% of our people back at work physically in the office. Um, the other 85% are still working remotely from home a year later. So, you know, if your culture is strong, if you have great clarity in what your business is, what your purpose is, if you have a land ambition within your company, and if you're truly committed to your clients, to being there, to servicing, understanding, anticipating their needs, you can carry on in a business like ours in terms of being able to, to service and help um, and navigate your clients' business uh, in partnership with them. And, uh, and so um, I guess embracing what we could do and, uh, and not focusing on what we couldn't and not for a minute feeling sorry for ourselves. And the other thing that I was determined to do was to keep as many people employed as possible um, throughout COVID and uh, within MNC Saatchi Able, we managed to retain 100% of our people. Now that came at a huge cost to bottom line profits, but I didn't feel that, you know, um, a pandemic is, as you used the word earlier, unprecedented times. You know, what you have to do is you have to take a different view of your business and you have to place humanity above commercial success. Uh, which means the bottom line of your own company. Um, and together you'll ride that storm and then together you'll succeed afterwards. How amazing, incredible. And that you actually employed 60 more people is just something phenomenal. Um, so you kept 100% of your staff plus 60 more people, which is something Great. really phenomenal. 
Um, I really love that story and the fact that your humanity is something that one should always keep in business, regardless of the circumstances, that should be foremost. I think that should drive your business because when you show your staff that they're appreciated, um, yes, you keep them motivated. They keep loyal to the company and you're a family. You remain as a family. So I love that you had online parties. How amazing. <laughs> Yeah. That's really incredible. Um, Mike, what would you suggest to entrepreneurs, you know, considering everything that we've spoken about and, and all your experience, what, suge what suggestion could you make with regards to any action they could take, like right now after watching the interview, what can they start doing in their business? What do you suggest? I think that uh, the first thing is a lot of people today um, pursue success. And um, it's very elusive when you pursue success. You know, there's a great saying, probably the last saying of our interview today, but the bird of paradise never lands on the grasping hand. And I think that if you focus on what you love, what you're passionate about, what you're good at, where your skills really lie, not where you hope your skills to lie. This isn't a time for fanciful ideas and uh, and uh, and kind of trialing uh, new things that uh, that are unproven. You know, during tough times, you've got to dig deep and you've got to say, where can I spot a real opportunity right now that is complementary to what I know and complementary to my skill set and complementary to my interests. And then to focus on that. Um, so whether it's being useful within a company, whether it is um, around, um, sorry, Karen, I can hear there's people are talking outside my office. I don't know if it's feeding back on your side at all. I can't hear a thing. Okay, good. So whether that is um, maybe taking a step back, maybe earning a little bit less, but, um, but gaining experience, um, and riding, riding the storm, or there might be an opportunity that you've been too scared to trial yourself um, and that these difficult circumstances have precipitated a new opportunity for reinvention in an area that you are interested in where you can see a clear and obvious opportunity. And I think that that is the most important thing is you have to be able to see the prize. You have to know what you're working towards, you know, so if you're saying, actually, today, what I'm doing is I'm working towards being able to ensure that I can pay the rent, pay, um, that make my car payments, make my school payments, whatever it is, you've got to do whatever it takes right now to kind of use that network, those skills that experience your passion and your talent to contribute positively to that. Because so many people that I talk to are approaching me off a negative base and of a victim mentality. And that doesn't precipitate a positive outcome. You, as I said earlier, and I've said it constantly, focus on what you can do, not on what you can't do. Don't bring your sad story to the business because that's not why people should be hiring. They should be hiring you or working in partnership with you because of the value you can bring, not because of a victim mentality. So I think if we channel our thoughts in a positive and practical way, you know, and you always have to be practical about it. And, and you've got to basically be able to put food on the table. And I think a lot of people right now, I'm talking to a lot of entrepreneurs that have got themselves into trouble. You know, right at the beginning, I spoke about cash flow. And they thought that this was a great moment for them to now go and start their own business. And I don't know why they thought it was a great opportunity to start their own business without the requisite um, uh, funding to do that. So I think that during difficult times, if you want to start your own thing, if you see an opportunity to using that word pivot to do something different, make sure that you have the enough uh, cash flow equals blood flow to see that thing through, to grow that business during difficult times. Um, but be practical. Um, listen to other people's advice and don't become fuspicious, headstrong, stuck on something. 
if you're picking up stuff that actually shifts your direction or that says this is why it might not work always listen to the, sh the angel on your shoulder don't ignore that voice that voice is a very important voice you know people under uh, i'll give you a lovely story you know picasso bumps into this woman in a coffee shop and she says mr picasso this is a defining moment for me won't you do a little squiggle for me to say that i've seen you met you and so he does a little squiggle on the napkin and he passes it to her across the table and he says that'll be five million dollars and she says but it took you 20 seconds and he said no it took me 70 years and that is what our gut feel is so people often ignore their gut feel that angel that i talk about because they think it's an instantaneous belief but actually what it is it's the cumulative knowledge of all of your life experience that's coming to bear in formulating that decision that's saying this is a great idea or it's a poor idea and so to listen to that thing and if it's saying something to you that you don't like still listen sometimes the best advice you get in life is not what you want to hear it's what you don't want to hear that proves invaluable so much value in that wisdom so much value and just in summary i guess to say that focus on the solution not the problem in summary this is what you've said focus on the solution not the problem such valuable incredible advice I can't and another thing, sorry, yeah. I want to add something to that, is people are always very quick, though, to jump to a solution. But what they might not have identified is the right problem. So problem verification is really important in business, not to focus on the problem, but to focus on verifying what the actual problem is, not the notional problem. Very, very important. Very important, because sometimes... I think that when we're kind of passionate about something, we, as we said before, sometimes we don't see things clearly. We see things emotionally. Um, we need to adjust our vision. And I, I totally agree with that. And I can't let you go or end this interview without asking you about this topic, your book, Willing and Able. Um, the most incredibly inspiring book. I mean, to the viewers, if you found this inspiring, the book is just as inspiring, if not more, because it's the full story. Um, we only have time for a short part of the story. And in fact, I could really interview you the entire day, but I know that you, you can't do that. So, <laughs> so um, one of our last questions is your willing and able book written by you. What inspired you to write that book. And I think you wrote that during lockdown, didn't you, Mike? Or was that ready uh, before? Well, we started the journey. Uh, and when I say we, I wrote it in collaboration with Tudor Paradox Davies, um, who's a really good author, a very smart man. And because I didn't actually have the bandwidth and the time to write that whole book myself. So it was a collaborative effort. Um, so I started writing the book heading towards the 10th anniversary of MNC Saatchi Able, very much around, um, I guess, giving people um, inspiration around how to build a company. And then COVID hit, and then we decided actually to shift the narrative slightly, or to shift the focus rather slightly to say, not just in terms of building business and in terms of building your life, in terms of dealing with adversity, in terms of taking people more behind the scenes of those individual stories and of those individual challenges that we have faced since inception. So it is called Willing and Able, Lessons from a Decade in Crisis. And I think that there are many lessons from that decade in crisis because we're still in crisis. Uh, in fact, we're in a greater crisis today than many of the years that we faced from um, you know, uh, 1 Feb 2010 when we opened our doors. And so it's really about very, the intention of the book is to be real, which it is, and to be useful, to give people practical examples and case studies and stories that they can hopefully apply to their own lives and their own businesses in terms of saying, well, what about this? Or maybe I could look at that. Um, so that's the purpose of the book. 
The book is incredibly inspiring, as I said before, and I would really highly recommend this book to any entrepreneur, anyone who's struggling or not struggling, um, either way. But I think if you're feeling as though you're struggling at the moment and you need some inspiration, this is really a, a great read um, with much wisdom in the read. Thank you. And the other thing, the other thing around it is also what I do want to do is for people to understand the importance of active citizenry and how they can also contribute to building and bettering this country um, as well. I think that's an important theme in the book is not to feel like you are a bystander to your own life, but to participate actively in improving the country. And the other thing is I talk a lot about immigration because I think people under, underestimate the beauty and the importance of home and connections and family. Uh, so hopefully we touch on that as well in the book. The book is available, I believe, on Amazon, right? It is. And, also, and for South African viewers on takealot.com. Um, Correct. Anywhere else, it's those two. Those and all major booksellers, so CNA, exclusive books, all of the independents have it. Uh, and then I think in two weeks' time, the audio book will be available. Oh, that's absolutely fabulous. And then where, and is the book available if it's on Amazon? Of course, it must be Kindle as well, Mike. Yeah, it's on Kindle. Okay, yeah. just, for, just for any international viewers who might so, be interested, I'd like to know that they can get hold of it. And then the audio book, will that also be through Amazon? It'll be through Audible. Yeah. Audible, okay, <laughs> Audible. I'm not, I've never... I can't say read an audio book, listen to an audio book. So I'm not too clued up, but that's important. That's okay. Amazing. So audible. Okay, incredible. I believe it's a big trend at the moment, actually. It's a massive trend, I believe. Yeah. So great yeah. that you've also gone gone that route. Um, Mike, any in closing, any podcasts or books that are your favorites that you would recommend? Sure. Um, so the one book, an, uh, an audio book that I just listened to is Robert Iger, Bob Iger, the global CEO of Disney, his book called Ride of a Lifetime, absolutely brilliant, very insightful, uh, spans his career, many, many big decisions, fascinating front row seats to deals with people like Steve Jobs and, uh, you know, some of the big names uh, in the entertainment business, but something in there that you can take back for your own businesses. Uh, I'm sure most of your listeners have read Shoe Dog, uh, The Full Night Story, start, who started Nike, brilliant book. The Founder's Mentality, which is basically these consultants looking at a whole lot of businesses that are owner-operated businesses that have now grown into major successes. And what was that founder's mentality? What was that magic that made that business hum at the time? and uh, many watch outs about how you can lose the magic in your business as you grow, how you can lose those values. So um, those are, are, are three books that come to mind immediately other than the uh, sweeping historical novels that, uh, that keep me awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a lot of magic. We've had um, almost an hour of magic and I'm so thrilled that you set aside the time it's really been incredible to speak to you and you've been somebody different uh, normally i speak to entrepreneurs who are not in a corporate kind of setting so you're an entrepreneur who's gone into a more corporate setting and it's very interesting to have heard your story and your journey mike thank you so much for sharing that with us i'm going to make sure that your web address is um inserted on the bottom of this video so that people know where to get hold of MNC Saatchi Abel. And um, just a massive, massive thank you for sharing your magic with us today. Great pleasure, Corin. It's been lovely chatting to you and thank you for inviting me onto your show. My pleasure.